All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Why don't you guys go ahead and stand your feet as people are still coming in. We are going to begin this worship service and begin praising our God.
worship you. We are gathered. We are going to give you praise, and we are going to give you honor. Father, I pray that as we do so, that we are joined together as one body, and we are giving you praise out of a pure heart, pure intentions. And we pray that everything that we say and do in this room gives you honor and praise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. Well, welcome all of you who are smart enough not to go camping on Memorial Weekend. Give yourself a hand. That's right. Woo! And look, it's not even raining. Normally it rains this weekend. But, uh, glad you are here. Really glad you're here this morning. If you are new with us, um, we want to make sure that you have information about us. So please, by all means, uh, go to the front of the sound booth after the service. There's the white bags there, a bunch of the white bags. Just grab one of those. It just has information in it about us, and we just invite you to take one of those, look through it, and uh, get familiar with us a little bit. And if you have questions after that, uh, give me a call, and I'd be glad to try to answer those the best I can. Not a whole lot in the way of announcements today, which is a good thing. Um, I just want to go ahead and invite our kids on up through fifth grade if they'd come up for their time of kids' worship together. So if you're new, what we do, we have a box that says, what is this? And I am supposed to teach them something about God from the box. Out of the box. Out of the box. Where is the box? It's almost worse when there is no box because then somebody throws something at me. Oh, wait, that's me throwing things at the people up here. (laughs) Really? Oh, my gosh. Holy cow. How do you wear this? This is, you got junk in the pockets or what? It is heavy. You can sit down. Can we sit down maybe? Nope. Linky's going to teach with me. Do you want to teach with me? Nope. He's out. All right. This is really heavy. Oh, my goodness. So what is this? Zach's coat. It is Zach's coat. It is. It is. Is it genuine leather? It is made out of leather. Do you know where leather comes from? That's right. Leather is made out of cows. What? No, really. God get, God created animals and people for a purpose. And when we use a cow either to eat or to make clothing to protect our bodies and keep us warm, they are serving their purpose. That's what God created them to do. God created each one of us with a purpose. Does does anybody know what our purpose is? Cow, this is the purpose of this is a jacket, but the purpose for I, this is heavy. The purpose for us is to glorify God, to to live for Him and to bring Him honor and glory. That's what we are made to do. Is that awesome or what? We have a purpose. A purpose is the thing we're supposed to do. So just like that leather coat was made, a cow was used for its purpose that God created it for, we have a purpose, and we have to live our lives to bring glory to God so that we, excuse me, fulfill our purpose. So anytime you see a cow, you can remember that cow has a purpose, And you have a purpose, too. All right. There you go. A heavy leather coat. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, you are a mighty, mighty, amazing, wonderful God. You are worthy of every one of us getting up this morning and giving this time to you as a sacrifice. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our adoration. Oh, Lord, thank you that you love each one of us enough to create us and to give us a purpose. Help us, God, to fulfill that purpose by living for you and bringing you honor and glory. God, I pray that you would go with these kids this morning as they go to their class. 
Give them minds that are ready to understand, hearts that are ready to receive, that what they learn, they would, they would take it into their lives and really live for you. I pray for your hand on their teachers that they would teach accurately and clearly and that they would teach boldly in love the truth that you have put in their hearts. I love you so much, and I thank you for each one of these kids. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, hello. All right. Real quick, I just want to give one last reminder about softball if you're interested. Uh, our first game is this Tuesday at 6.30. It'll be at the Willow Field. Uh, if you're not sure yet where that's at, um, between 128th and 120th on the east side of the road, there's the field. Um, on Back here, there will be a, a um, schedule which will have our games just specifically for our team this year. Uh, it will give uh, addresses on there for the fields and all the information we need as well there. And if you need to contact me or Steve, who is not here still yet, uh, he's still recovering. Um, but if you have any questions, our numbers are on there. Uh, we are still currently, I, I know I've heard that there might be some floaters going around uh, who might be interested in playing. We have seven signed up right now. Uh, to have a team, we need ten. Uh, so if you're still on the fence or thinking about it uh, and still have any questions, feel free to come up and talk to me about it. Um, and, and also, if the season starts and you're still interested in playing but you haven't signed up yet, you're still fine. So don't think that you have this deadline and you, just, you can't join after that. Uh, even throughout the season, if you go, hey, I still want to play softball, feel free to come on up even if it's the middle of the season and we'll get you up on the roster. So uh, if you're still wanting to play or know anybody who might be interested, Please uh, come find me and sign up. I'll be back there today by the sign-up sheet. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right. Let's take a moment together, shall we? And uh, let's talk to God. Father, you are such a good God. We're grateful, Lord, again, to be able to be here and to worship you, Lord. And we pray that you be honored by everything we see and hear. Thank you, Father, for this nation. As we... Pause this weekend and remember those who gave their life in the cause of its freedoms. Father, we pray that uh, you continue to comfort those families who uh, perhaps are mourning the loss of loved ones today. Lord, I pray that uh, this weekend that we will honor you as we honor them, realizing, Lord, that freedom is uh, something certainly that we enjoy uh, here in this country, but, Lord, around the world, people are enjoying freedom in Christ, and we want to honor both. So I pray, Lord, that you certainly will indeed be honored. Fathers, we give today. We want to give to you, Lord, because you give to us, and you, uh, you ask us to show our trust in you. You ask us to show our allegiance to you, and so, Lord, we give. And we pray, Father, that as we do, you'll be honored in that and that you'll give us wisdom, Lord, in how to use those resources to continue to reach around this community, uh, to continue to build up this body, to continue to reach around the world, Lord, to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them so that your Holy Spirit can then work and move, change hearts, and draw people to you. So to that end, we give. In Jesus' name. We'll receive the offering at this time. If you did remember to go ahead and put uh, write down that communication card, tear it off. You can throw it in the basket when it comes by. He became sin who knew no sin that he might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and he carried the
stone is rolled away, behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah, God be praised, He's risen from the grave, on the rugged cross.
loved you so much that I can now experience freedom from sin. You know, that is what we praise today. That is what we give thanks for. That is what we celebrate today. Maybe see that. I was 10 years old when the war in Vietnam ended. My Uncle Frank fought in that war. And that's about really all I know. I can scarcely remember when he came home from the service. I never heard war stories. I never heard anything about his military service whatsoever. I mean, it was almost as if that war never existed. I mean, shoot, it wasn't even called a war for the longest time. If you remember, it was called the conflict in Vietnam. You know, I often wonder what it would be like for those people who called it that. You know, if they had to stand there and take the bullets and they had to take the mortar fire, you know, if they had to do the hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff, would they still call it a conflict or would it be a war? But as I digress, that's not what I'm here for today. I'm sure, I'm sure that thing was all over the news when I was a kid, uh, but honestly, I didn't notice it. I was more concerned about sports and cartoons than I was watching the news reports, but uh, you just didn't hear stuff. You know, I didn't hear the conversations in my home about it. I didn't hear conversations at school about it. I didn't hear conversations in church about it. It just seemed to not be talked about. In fact, it wasn't until I got into high school where I really first got familiar with the Vietnam War. And I have to be honest with you, it really intrigued me. I was probably intrigued more so by the, the psychological effect that it had on those who fought in it while they were fighting as well as when they came home. You know, here in the United States, that wasn't a very popular war. And when folks came back from serving in that war, they were treated like they were second-class citizens, even treated like they were criminals. There were no parades, celebrations, no thank yous for your service like we see today. Since then, I'm glad our country's gotten that right, and we finally have given respect to these folks who served in that, uh, just like we do those who have served in any of our other uh, wars that we've had here in this nation. See, this week, this weekend, marks an observance that has, goes all the way back to 1868, where then commander-in-chief of, uh, named Jogan, uh, John Logan, who was the commander-in-chief of the Grand Army of the Republic, issued his uh, General Order Number 11, designating that May 30th 
would be called Memorial Day, or back then they called it Decoration Day. Because the purpose of it, in his words, was for strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion, referring to the Civil War, and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. That was the original purpose. Now, since then, our government has gotten together and in 1971 made it federal law to change this observance to the last Monday in May. And it included, at that point, everybody who had given their lives in service to any of the wars in our nation. You know, Jesus says in John chapter 15, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. We need to be sure that we understand that Memorial Day is not about those who serve in the military. They have a special day for that called Veterans Day. We honor them on those days. But Memorial Day is specifically for those who have given their life while serving. They died in the act of it. This is an observance, honestly, that really should stir us to the depths of our soul. If you're a believer and a patriot, this ought to really fire you up because the both of them have a lot that they share in common that we honor and that we remember this morning. We're going to talk about a soldier this morning. We're going to talk about a soldier who fought many battles on behalf of his nation particularly one that cost him his life. We're going to talk about those that he served and the way that he was treated by those who opposed his mission. We're going to talk about the outcome of his service, and we're going to talk about the victory that it obtained, and therefore the freedoms that we all get to enjoy because of it. And to help us do that, we're going to open up our Bibles today. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, Old Testament Uh, If you grabbed a Bible when you came in, you can find it quickly on page 610. We'll have it up on the screen as well. But Isaiah 53 is going to give us a better look at this soldier as we talk about him this morning. We're going to begin with reading verse 2. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. See, by all accounts, this soldier had no outstanding features to him, didn't have any real commanding presence to him that commanded the respect of the men when he walked by or even got the attention of the ladies when he walked by. He apparently didn't really have any kind of political clout, no political influence whatsoever, and he didn't have a chest strapped full of medals from his military accomplishment. Nor was he really the -the over-the-top extrovert who was the life of the party whenever you showed up. He just was kind of your average, run-of-the-mill. Nah, you really don't even notice he's there unless, you know, you know he's there kind of a guy. You could say that he kind of had a humble existence, you know, a humble beginning even. A number of our generals throughout history would fit this description. We get uh, General Ulysses S. Grant who was born in Ohio to a tanner and a merchant. You got General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was born in Pennsylvania to a general store owner who eventually became a railroad mechanic. You got General Creighton Abrams, born in Springfield, Massachusetts, who was the son of a railroad worker. And you got General Colin Powell, born in Harlem, New York, raised in the South Bronx, and who himself uh, worked in a baby furniture store. And then, of course, you can't forget this one. There there was this soldier who was born in Bethlehem in a stable to a carpenter. Yet he rose to the highest rank that ever was given to anybody. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 2. God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Man, what an honor. But you know, just like those who were returning from Vietnam, we read in verse 3, he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with the deepest grief We turned our backs on him, and we looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. You know, I really have a hard time with this verse. 
not only because of my fascination with and my empathizing with those who served in the Vietnam War, not because of my disdain for how they were treated when they returned home, but because there's something in me that has just never been okay with that kind of behavior. It's never been okay with treating people differently just because they're different than we are, whether they're different economically or they're different physically or they're different mentally. There's just, in my opinion, there's just something cruel and intolerable about that kind of behavior. And it always caused me to kind of rise up in defense of them. It still does. still does. You know, I, I still carry that with me when I hear people badmouth our military today. It makes me angry. So it's hard for me to imagine how Jesus must have felt when, when he was received by the people that he created, the very people that he created, particularly the fact that they didn't seem to really care about him. They didn't really care what he thought. They didn't care about how they were treating him. They don't care how they're treating him today. And I feel the same way about that. Let's keep reading, verse 4 through 8. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment from his own, for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. You know, one of the things that really boils my blood is to watch people today remain seated or in the political platform that we know as professional sports, kneel during the playing of the national anthem. I think it's the most disrespectful thing that you can do to the memory of those who gave their lives for people to have those freedoms to go and watch those games, to participate in those games. I feel bad for the families of those who's, who are the family of the loved ones who gave their life for freedom's cause. But you know, my oldest son, Michael, is a former Marine. He gave me a little different perspective on this one. See, he shares the same angst for that that I do. But he will maintain that that's what he signed up to protect. People's rights. People's rights, no matter what those rights are, they're rights. And one of those rights, of course, that we're guaranteed is the right to protest. He doesn't like how they're protesting, but he will say that he was willing to give his life for them to maintain the right to protest that way. Well, in much the same way, Jesus signed up, if you will, to give all of us rights that we otherwise wouldn't have had if we tried to obtain it on our own. We couldn't do it on our own. He had to fight the battle for us. We tried. We failed. But way back to the garden, we couldn't do it. But ultimately, ultimately Jesus suffered what we deserved. And so when I think about Jesus and I think about all these folks that have given their lives so that you and I can enjoy the freedoms we experience today, today we remember their service. We want to remember their service. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. You know, for the thousands upon thousands of those folks who were willing to serve, they did so willingly. They chose. Now, you can say, hey, you know, some of us were drafted. Yeah, well, you still had choices when you were drafted, too, and you still served. And I'm grateful that you served. Many in this nation were fortunate to serve at a time when their cause was popular. 
And when they returned home, they were given a hero's welcome. But a good number of them also served at a time when it wasn't popular. And when they returned home, they weren't given a hero's welcome. In fact, they were jeered at. They were spit upon. They were called all sorts of horrible things. Likewise, Jesus chose to be obedient by serving. And he too was jeered at. He too was spit at. He too had horrible things said to him and said about him. He was even treated like a criminal. See, the thing is, though, that when these other folks served, when they signed up to serve, you know, they had a pretty good idea what they were getting into, except for those who went to Vietnam. They didn't have any idea that that's how they were going to be treated when they come home. They didn't know. Jesus knew. He had a pretty good idea how he was going to be treated. We read in Matthew chapter 20. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. They will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. See, he knew. He knew that he was going to be rejected. He knew how his creation was going to treat him. And yet he went. He willfully carried out his mission. And here it is, Romans chapter 5, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for sinners. Now, most, of, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Jesus says, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. He didn't have to. But because he loves us, he willfully, he willfully endured what he knew what he was going to endure ahead of time. He willfully endured it out of love. See, between those who fought in so many battles here on earth and in Jesus, who has fought so many spiritual battles, who are willing to give their lives so that you and I wouldn't have to. Not only do we want to remember their service today, but we want to remember their sacrifice. It's huge. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many, and he interceded for the rebels. You know, whenever you go to war, you need a plan if you want to be successful. If you want to defeat the enemy, you got to plan ahead of time. You know, the plan to invade, the, invade Normandy and the beaches of Normandy, that plan was in the works for well over a year before they implemented it. See, it's important. you got to know what your goal is. you got to know what it is you're trying to accomplish. You have to know what you want to achieve in order to be able to keep on, on point when you're developing your plan. As time goes along, you got to keep being able to check. Is this fitting what we're trying to accomplish? Is this fitting what we're trying to accomplish? Is this fitting what we're trying to accomplish? Well, God had a plan. And he was able to check it along the way. Here we go again, Romans chapter 5. Since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. That's good news. And since our our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us Friends of God. That's a great plan. And he's carrying it out. He's implementing it. He's checking it along the way. 
Now, there's no doubt, no doubt that democracy is under attack today. But you know, the enemy is not necessarily foreign. We're in a battle right now over the souls of men and women in this country. If you haven't noticed. And what we're ultimately trying to achieve is their salvation. We want to see them be able to get their relationship restored, to get their relationship right with God once again. And we're told in Romans chapter 12, here's how we do this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, we understand that we are in a psychological warfare. If we want to win the hearts of mankind, we need the Holy Spirit to help people change the way they think. That's not something that we can do. Holy Spirit's got to do that. We need Jesus to fight the battle for us. And in doing so, we understand that as mankind's mind begins to change, their heart will follow. And when that happens, an allegiance to God begins to take place so that social order can be restored. From the heart, or the head to the heart, to the way that they live. That's how you change a nation. God says, Deuteronomy chapter 5, you must be careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God, following instructions in every detail. Stay on the path that the Lord your God has commanded you to follow. Then you will live long and prosperous lives in the land that you're about to enter and occupy. See, God gave Moses the plan for victory, and it was really quite simple. He says, be transformed in the way you think, and then you'll be transformed in the way you live. But see, that requires something from you and me too. Matthew chapter 16, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. See, we have to be willing to die too. We've got to die to ourselves. We've got to die to our selfishness. We've got to be able to yield our way to God's way in every area of our life. Just as men, women chose to die, just as Christ chose to die, and as you and I choose to die, we can gain victory. That's the promise from Scripture. See, God knew what was going to happen to Jesus wasn't clueless. He knew it was going to happen. Acts chapter 2, it says God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses to this. Now he's exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven and at God's right hand. And in the Father, as he's promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out on all of us. That's a phenomenal plan. And we're seeing it. We're living it. We're witnesses to it. See, through death, we became a nation. Through death, we've maintained our democratic existence to this point. Through death, we've been redeemed. And through death, we've been given victory and freedom. So today, as we remember their service, as we remember their sacrifice, we're also going to remember and honor their victory. And as we do so, we're going to give thanks. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my hope this weekend is that, you know, and we get doing all the parties and get-togethers and all that kind of stuff, my hope is that we will just slow down a little bit, that we will pause to remember. To remember what 
folks were willing to give their lives for us for freedoms in this country, to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who willfully gave his life so that you could experience freedom in this lifetime and beyond, my hope is that we'll pause and we'll remember. Not just today, but every day. And as we do, I hope it drives you to your knees. I hope it makes you give thanks to God. For he's certainly worthy of our praise and our appreciation. Let's pray. Father, we do live in a country where we get to enjoy unprecedented freedoms. Many countries don't get to experience this. So we are here, so we give thanks to you for that, Lord. We are grateful that this is the nation we live in. Certainly, Lord, our nation has its issues, and we do pray for it. We pray, Father, that it will return to you, that your Holy Spirit will come and pour yourself upon us. Lord, change the minds of people so that they, you can change the heart of people so that it will change the way that we live in this nation. You can bring about that revival. Lord, we also give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, for loving us enough, Lord, knowing that we could not get our relationship right with you on our own. You were willing to sacrifice your own son. And he willfully came to lay his life down so that we wouldn't have to. And as he rose again from the dead, Lord, he gave us life and gave us life over death that we can conquer death so that one day, Father, that we can live eternally with you and he in heaven. Father, we're excited about that. But Lord, there's so many in our nation who are missing out on that. And God, I just pray that you will move in our souls such an urgency to talk to the people we know, the people we come in contact with, so that before the end of this world comes, as we know you've already set that date in motion before you even created it, Lord, I pray that before it comes, we will be able to take as many people with us as possible. Move us. Energize us, stir us, make us restless for the souls of, of men and women in this nation and around the world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. True freedom is not actually free, it costs something. In this last song, what I want to do is I want to focus on that. of all transactions, the costliest purchase price, Father, your Son's atoning death was given in payment for mine, to buy me back from slavery, to set me free from my chains.
folks we get to enjoy freedoms like nobody else but we also live as children of God with the greatest freedom of all we have freedom in Christ to not live condemned anymore to not live in fear of the future to not live in fear of eternity but to stand before God confident knowing because of the blood of Jesus Christ we are redeemed infinitely, forever redeemed. And so this weekend, man, enjoy, but pause, give honor to those who gave their lives for the freedoms we enjoy in this country, and make sure you pause and give thanks for the freedom that you enjoy in Christ. Go in peace. May the God of love and peace go with you, now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great weekend.